All right, it is 135. So up next we have Danielle Nelson with the FTA talking about what is CCAM. Um, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions for her at the end. So go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and then Danielle, I will hand it off to you. Great. Thank you, Danny. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Nelson. I work at the Federal Transit Administration, and I'm the program manager for the Coordinated Council on Access and Mobility, which I will be sharing a brief update with you all today. And let's make sure I can advance my slides. There we go. For those who might not be familiar, uh, the Coordinated Council on Access and Mobility, or CCAM for short, um, was started back in 2004 with an executive order. <clears throat> it was then put into our authorizing legislation, the FAST Act, uh, which was the last authorization. And so now it's officially um, carried into USDOT or FTA's uh, legislation. And so the mission of the CCAM is to issue policy recommendations and implement activities that improve the availability, accessibility, and efficiency of transportation for three target populations. So older adults, individuals with disabilities, and individuals of, or families with low income. And it is uh, chaired by the uh, Secretary of DOT, who has delegated it to FTA. And there are 10 other federal departments that are, are a part of it that you can see there on the organization. And I wanted to share a resource I think would be most helpful to this audience, which is a program inventory that we developed back in 2019. And so we worked collaboratively across the 11 federal departments, and we found that there are 130 different federal grant programs across the CCAM agencies that are able to provide funding to human services transportation. So back when the <clears throat> charter rule was passed in 2008, Appendix A to the charter rule, which lists the CCAM programs, was the first time the CCAM worked to develop this inventory. And back in 2008, when the charter rule was published, there were 64 programs. And then in 2012, GAO updated that list, um, and it went to 80. And so in 2019, there's 130. And the CCAM is about to update it again, and we've already captured several new programs. Um, but as you can see there, the Department of Health and Human Services has the most programs with USDA having the least. And I thought it would be helpful just to explain why the program inventory would be most useful to you guys if you haven't seen it. It's a searchable database um, and it allows state and local partners to find detailed program information in one centralized location about the different federal programs that may fund transportation. And it maps out the types of activities each program can spend. So there's um, several sections that talk about what's eligible for that program's funds. Is mobility management uh, an eligible expense? Yes or no. Can you purchase a vehicle? Yes or no. Can you purchase transit passes um, or the cost of a fare? Is that eligible? Yes or no, et cetera. So it really is kind of a roadmap for partnerships. And, um, and I thought it would also be helpful just to share some of the programs found in inventory by different departments. So as I mentioned, the Department of Health and Human Services has 66 programs. Some of those examples are Head Start under the Administration for Children and Families, the High Obesity Program uh, through CDC, which goes to uh, land-grant universities, and it funds uh, uh, you can pay for transportation to get low-income, um, morbidly obese folks in rural areas to healthy food access. Um, and then also the um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has the PACE program, which is out of the Medicare side of the house, not Medicaid. Um, and that is for dual eligibles, meaning um, it funds transportation for uh, older adults. So they're over 65, they're Medicare eligible, as well as they're low income. So they're also Medicaid eligible. And then Healthy Start Initiative, that's out of the Health Resources and Service Administration, and that's for low-income new mothers to make, who um, are going to be mothers to get to their prenatal appointments and then also receive care for their infants and themselves following birth. Um, the Department of Labor has 11 programs, and the Department of Justice has 10 programs, and I've listed some of those here. The Department of Justice, most of their programs have come out of the opioid epidemic, some were existing there are um, a lot of programs through their Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency, such as mentoring programs to help set kids up for success who might already be into the uh, criminal justice system, as well as family drug court programs to help um, get parents who have lost the ability to drive but need to access um, drug screening or court ordered required programs. They have a hard time accessing those without the access to a reliable car 
or sometimes living in very rural areas, long distances to get to the court appointments. And then um, the Department of Labor has several programs around jobs and employment, as well as veterans um, uh, reintegration programs. The Department of Education has 10 programs. And then most people are surprised about the Department of Interior and how many programs they have as well. Um, and so I've listed some of those here. And then lastly, the Veterans um, Administration has three programs and the Department of Agriculture has two. Most people are familiar with USDA's um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, used to be called Food Stamps. And then with that, I wanted to also mention another resource I thought you all would be interested in. We developed a federal fund braiding guide. This was published in 2020. So keeping in mind of the 130 programs, we met with the general counsel's office of 61 of those programs, as well as our general counsel's office, and looked at um, which of those programs have explicit statutory authority to accept other federal funds as a local match, both as outgoing and incoming. And so many of you probably already know, but um, FTA has three specific programs where Congress has given us um, explicit authority to accept other federal funds as local match. So that I, I put the URL link there. You can see it um, for section 5307, 5310, and 5311. We have explicit authority to accept other federal funds. So the graphic you can see there on the screen, both a vehicle and a mobility manager being funded 80% with 5310, or you could do 5311, 5307 funds. And then an example of the 20% local match being funded through the Administration for Community Living's Centers for Independent Living or Older Americans Act Supportive Services Program. So you could have a 100% federally funded grant program. And just to be clear, um, federal fund braiding for local match is when federal funds from one grant program are used to fulfill the local match requirement of another federal grant program. And I wanted to give a <clears throat> real world example of that, of one that's currently happening now out of New Hampshire. So in New Hampshire, they're using a CDC COVID disparities grant that they received as local match to their 5310 rural funding. And they're using that to fund uh, mobility managers in rural communities in New Hampshire. <clears throat> so they're having 100% federally funded mobility managers in that state. And I wanted to mention coordinated human services transportation and really the importance of this in terms of um, using cost sharing, sharing passenger trips and vehicles, and cross-funding partnerships like the federal fund braiding example I just mentioned out of New Hampshire. And of course, the benefits of that, more cost-effective use of limited resources, uh, greater access to funds when you're partnering across those federal grant programs locally or at the state, um, you can stretch your limited resources and dollars further. And I wanted to give some examples. I saw um, Jeremy Johnson Miller on here, who um, works for the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, such a great resource. <clears throat> That's one center we fund, as well as the National Center for Mobility Management, and of course, the National Rural Transit Assistance Program, great resources that are funded um, and managed out of the office I'm at here at FTA. We also have, when Congress put um, the CCAM into the FAST Act, they also created a brand new pilot program We've renamed it several times over the years since it was created in 2016. We first called it Rides to Wellness. Um, it's currently, we're calling it by the um, explicit name in the FAST Act, which is the Innovative Coordinated Access Mobility, or ICAM for short. That's another way we're incentivizes, incentivizing coordination with human services transportation. And then the very exciting resource, I hope you've all seen already, but we just published it last month in March is the new transportation coordination guidance FTA just put out. So we worked um, across our budget and policy office, our general counsel's office, because um, it has charter rule <clears throat> clarifications, and then also um, the NTD. And so it really, the guidance aims to reduce overlap between those 130 federal programs that may, may fund transportation to encourage um, partnerships with public transit. So rather than funding a separate VA van, a separate senior center van, a separate um, uh, van at the mental health clinic and a separate van for the community health center. By coordinating those trips onto one public transit service, 
um, it's more efficient. And then also you can report that data into the National Transit Database, getting additional funding for your community back in return. So the topics that that clar guidance clarification addresses is the definition of public transit, paratransit, charter service, and explicitly the exception for Appendix A for those human services organizations funded by other CCAM programs. It also clarifies incidental use and gives examples of vehicle sharing arrangements, um, as well as meal delivery arrangements, and then talks about how those arrangements can be anywhere from free to uh, the transit agency being reimbursed for the fully allocated cost of those trips and also trip brokering. And of course, mobility management, um, a great resource that we're helping our other federal departments better understand what it is, how they can fund it, encouraging them to embrace it. And so I know that this group is very familiar with mobility management. And then I just wanted to end with some of our great resources. So I mentioned earlier um, NADTC, which their mission is promoting the availability and accessibility of transportation options for older adults and people with disabilities and their caregivers. And then I have the contact for each center um, linked there, the director's um, email, as well as their website. And then of course, National uh, RTAP, their goal is to address the training and technical assistance needs of rural and tribal agencies across the country. The National Center for Applied Transit Technology, or NCAT, their goal is helping small urban, rural, and tribal transit operators understand techno technological tools that are available to them and how to apply them to their community. We also have the National Center for Mobility Management. Their goal is promoting customer-centered mobility strategies that advance, advance good health, economic vitality, and self-sufficiency in communities. And then last but not least is the Shared Use Mobility Center. They're working to achieve equitable, affordable, and environmentally sound mobility options across the US through sharing efficient transportation resources. And a, a new resource that the centers I just mentioned have been working collaboratively on is a transportation technical assistance coordination library. So rather than making you all go to five different websites to search for different resources across those websites, this is a platform, a one-stop shop, where all of those centers are, are um, linking their resources. So if you go to Tackle is what it's called for short, and you are interested in case studies, or you wanna know about accessible bike share options or uh, mobility management strategies, what you can do is just go to Tackle, search it, and then it'll take you, it'll list all of the resources across all of these different um, technical assistance center websites and house it there for you. And then when you, you find the resource you want and you click it, it actually redirects you to that uh, TA center's website. So it's a helpful resource. We're just still building out and hoping to make things easier for you all to find things across our um, excellent TA centers. And if you're not familiar, our uh, three of our TA centers I just mentioned provide community grants. And these are great opportunities to receive not only funding, but also um, intense, helpful technical assistance. And so the National Rural Transit Assistance Program recently awarded their Community Rides Grant Program. And these were grants for up to 100,000 to existing 5311 and tribal transit program grantees and it was focused on social determinants of health. And I just wanted to give you two examples. There were 19 projects funded. Um, one was in Nebraska and they got just under 100,000 for a new transit service where there was not existing public transit. So what they did is they expanded transportation from a neighboring county into a county where it was a transit desert and they received additional support from the state DOT. And some of the, um, partners in this grant are the healthcare providers as well as the local area agencies on aging. And then another example is in Wisconsin, and they have a, uh, developed a new van pool program with a large employer in the area. And it was the only employer in the area who was interested in um, hiring individuals with a criminal record. And so it's a local manufacturer. And the other partner is the local county sheriff's office who runs the uh, region's work release program. And the um, VAN program is open to the public as well. And then the National Aging Disability Transportation Center, their community grants focus on increasing access to transportation 
developing new models and increasing the availability and accessibility of transportation services for older adults and people with disabilities. And they really focus on 5310 funding and how to stretch that funding. And so some examples here in 2020 in Kansas, they um, developed a non-emergency medical transportation um, services program. And then in 2019, a grant out of New Mexico, they developed a curb to curb program for individuals with disabilities and older adults in remote areas of the Navajo reservation. <clears throat> And they actually, through the program, hired Navajo elders as drivers and hired individuals who spoke the Navajo language. And then in 2018, they funded a area agency on aging in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to help provide access to healthy food sources for older adults and people with disabilities by providing and building new partnerships and encouraging strong community involvement to identify those solutions and better connect those living in food deserts. And then the last example is in 2017, in uh, Massachusetts, they um, developed, a, developed a program uh, to offer medical transportation in a remote or rural area. And um, the National Center for Mobility Management, they do their grants where it's a planning grant. And then the same year they offer then a um, pilot of the types of grants. So they call them learning Mobility design grants are the uh, planning grants, and then the learning launch are the pilots. And I've listed the um, current grantees there. And that is all. So I'm happy to take questions. I just wanted to mention I did in the appendix um, list any relevant resources I thought you might be interested in, as well as a full list of all of the sub agencies across those. Um, 11 federal departments who are involved in CCAM, if anybody wanted to see who those were. All right, if you have any questions, go ahead and put questions in the chat or feel free to come off mute. Yes, I see. Um, I will put the links to the resources in the chat. No problem, Brian. And my, also my contact information. Okay. I have a question sure. um, for those of us in the transit industry, and we're more familiar with the CCAM process than probably, you know, those in the human service and things like that. How do we? I mean, I know they can use their money, but every like we've tried to reach out to several of them and been like, oh, that you can do this. And they're like, yeah, we know we can, but we don't want to. Like, <laughs> um, or, you know, I think they think that they're, I don't really know what the issue is, but how, we need a better way to approach them and get them to understand the importance of mm -hmm. funding transportation because they have the program that we need to get people, that they want people to get to. Mm -hmm. And so we try to tell them that, if people didn't need to get there, transportation wouldn't be needed, but it's your program and you need to help fund it. And they're like, well, you already get funding and that's your job to do that. And there has to be a better narrative of us to get our foot in the door to try to explain what that means. So do you have any suggestions? I know the exact challenge you're talking about. <laughs> um, when Nuria, our FTA administrator, sent letters inviting all of her new political counterparts to be involved in CCAM, we got a couple responses of why should DOJ be involved? Transportation isn't in our mission. But as soon as we talked with them and explained a lot of your justice involved individuals no longer have access to a driver's license or they have they don't have reliable transportation to get to these court appointed appointments. And once we explained family drug court, if they can't get to these appointments, they're losing their children who then are in foster care. So explaining to them we shouldn't have to sell so hard, but unfortunately, as soon as they understand, wait, transportation access does matter. And it, even though it's not in my mission statement, without it, we can't realize our mission. But what I'm hearing might be helpful is maybe talking points that address the mission of these programs and how transportation access. So instead of you having to come up with your own talking points, if we sort of helped to develop those, so when you have those state and local conversations, they get I think it. that would be really helpful for, okay. for transit. Um, yeah, I think that would be great. 
Um, Brooke said we often hear from the frontline staff about transportation being a barrier. The challenge comes from getting buy-in on policymakers. Some of these are national programs. And I think part of, I mean, one of the ones that we really, really, really tried really hard was to break that um, dialysis barrier with some of the dialysis providers. And they say that it's, you know, the top, at the top people in, in their um, agencies have said, no, we're not going to fund transportation because it then provides a benefit that makes it not, it makes them look better than the other dialysis people. And that's, they can't do that for competition or something. I, I don't really know exactly whether it was been a while back, but um, that's just something else we struggle with is getting them to understand the importance of that. They, so, they called it they called it preferential treatment. So if oh, yeah. they had someone they knew that lived in a really remote rural area with no access to transportation, they would consider funding one trip. But that was their their policy was one trip maximum, like for the lifetime of the dialysis patient. And as you know, people are, can be on dialysis for many years. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing, it would be helpful if the CCAM put out resources about the safe harbor anti-kickback and the caveat that they they technically are allowed to, as long as they offer it to everybody and not just Medicaid provide um, or just a subset. It has to be, there are rules to how they can offer transportation. So would clarify. And this? I think that would be helpful because they did tell us that there's rules. And so the top level of their um, agency has just said, we're not going to deal with that. It's easier for us just to say, no, we're not providing any transportation. Um, but if so we knew, if we understood that as well, we'd at least be on the level talking field with them um, on how we could help with that. Okay. It's actually perfect timing to hear this because we're developing our CCAM strategic plan. So it sounds like we need an activity around safe harbor clarification guidance and um, anti-kickback specific to transportation with a dialysis carve out. Oh, I think that would be really helpful. But yeah, giving us those talking points too, I think um, if, because if it was more consistent across transportation providers talking about that, I think we have, you know, we're all sending the same message instead of each individual transit system trying to figure out their own talking points and, and what mm -hmm. that looks like. And maybe that's why some are successful and some are not. Yeah. So um, another question, Danielle, is time to research. This is from um, Kelly Angel and she's with the Cancers. Um, society's time to research and understand which grant to apply for can be overwhelming for healthcare providers. What is your best advice for a step one for healthcare providers who may want to look at applying for transportation grants? And yes, healthcare providers could use a good safe harbor ruling 101 on providing transport. And um, as the Cancer Society, and Kelly was really instrumental in this, uh, she did get it, they did get a transportation grant for um, Central Iowa transportation to get people to and from treatment. And it was great until the grant went away and then the program goes away. And it's mm -hmm. like, how, we're, you know, so then it's not funded anymore and there's nobody that wants to pick up that funding. And so that's always some of the issue with transportation as well. But anyway, do you have anything to say about that? I would definitely say, Kelly, that a good start would be through the TA centers because those grants um, are much easier to apply for than coming in for an FTA discretionary grant, like that Innovative Coordinated Access Mobility Grant I mentioned, um, which really you would need a, someone to act as path through for the ICAM grant. But the TA centers, as long as you have a partner, a partner that's a public transit provider in that um, so it, if, you're, if you're dealing with patients with cancer, I would say the National Aging and Disability Transportation Grants are very relevant. And those grants are usually annually. They have been at least in, um, I'd have to talk with Destiny as my colleague who manages the NADTC, but Jeremy's on here. So Jeremy might know um, more intel of, I would definitely sign up for their newsletters. 
because you'll as soon as it's publicly posted you'll get a notification from the newsletters of when their grants are out um, the national center for building management i manage that one they will have uh, community grants again this year um, if you sign up for their newsletters you'll then get notification as soon as those grants are released um, what i like most about the ta center grants is they're really about developing partnerships with local human services agencies it's about figuring out and in a way, Julia, they help make those conversations happen of why um, the local health and human services agencies should care about the access mobility. It's, if you have a, a USDA summer meal program, if those kids that receive free and reduced lunches during the school year still need to get to that healthy meal in the summer, but they have no way to get there with transportation, how good is that healthy meal if, they, if those children can't get there? So it's all about formalizing these partnerships because the mission can't be met without that transportation piece. Right. And so um, those okay. TA centers can really help make those conversations happen. And also they know best practices, other communities who have cracked that nut and have really figured out developing those partnerships and making them work. That's good information. Um, another comment is expanding a county's reach to a neighboring one that lacks transportation is a great idea. What kind of challenges would one face in implementing this? Such a great question. And actually, I'll go back to that exact um, National RTAP example. Um, the good news about National RTAP is they are actually um, developing each of these 19 grants into replicable best practices. They're documenting the grants, the challenges each one has had in implementing and rolling them out, the partnerships. Um, and then they're going to be doing presentations on each project so that we can all learn from them. And they're actually, um, their board meeting is next week. So they're going to be giving an update next week that we'll hear about these projects like the one in Wisconsin. And, and um, it's the Nebraska one that's doing the neighboring county. They're broadening the project. So I will be listening myself to hear about the challenges that that project has been facing and how they're um, how they're doing. So I would just say stay tuned. I, I myself am learning more. And um, Kara Marcus is the person at National RTAP managing the grants. So if you're curious and would like to know, um, I will share her email. Kara's great about sharing information. So she really is. So, Danielle, we um, kind of going back to the Kelly Angels, the grant she got with the American Cancer Society. So we all know that grants are, are great and they help us get a project started. But like Julia said, the sustainable funding is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. And with transit systems, I mean, obviously, we don't have a lot of staff, at least not administrative or, or office type workers. Mm -hmm. um, but we we, by definition, look at services much more and performance metrics. Um, so we've kind of talked recently about ways that we could partner with um, people like Kelly or people who are working at the clinics or just in healthcare um, to kind of tell that story. Are you aware of any programs that are doing that now? Like transit systems that are partnering up with um, providers to to jointly go to funders and try to you know extend that grant to permanent sustainable funding one project that comes to mind is out of flint michigan mta the mass transit administration authority um they're a small urban area but they um it was a really great write-up and a tcrp project which now is escaping me but it talks in the project it published how they first started it started out of a dialysis. They basically went to the um, Health and Human Services and said, we can provide trips to dialysis for this cost for the Medicaid folks. And they agreed upon a rate. And then it just basically broadened from there. And now they've added local mental health clinics, local um, senior centers. They're basically doing a demand responsive service. But each of the human services agencies pays the fare on behalf of their riders. And so they've, they've really broadened that um, demand responsive and they pay the same, the, for example, the senior center pays the same amount as a public, public person like myself if I wanted to ride it, but they just pay for that individual. Um, 
so that's one example. And there's a write up. And I think actually, um, Jeremy, I think NADTC did a blog post too about the um, Flint project and sort of how they got it off the ground. And they went from a pilot and how they sustained the project and ended up funding it that way. Does that answer your question, Brooke, as an example? Yeah, it might be something that, you know, as we continue that conversation and, and how to do that. Um, Another you know, example, reach, they sorry, also, the, the PACE program, that um, program for all inclusive for the elderly, uh, Flint is the only community I know of where the public transit agency is providing that um, all PACE programs across the country have to have a transportation component. And that's the only community I'm aware of where it's a public transit agency providing that, they're contracted to do that service versus either the PACE program hiring their own and doing it themselves, um, or they're doing a private agency. So, and that's a sustainable funding source that now Flint uses as match to their other programs like their 5307 and 5310 program. Mm. So that's one example of, if, and I know that um, Harmony Lloyd presented on that at a, um, CMS conference I was at, and it was a really great presentation, uh, which I have a copy of, I'd be happy to share with you all and also give you her, it's probably better to hear from her directly than me passing on her presentation, but I thought it was a really great, and she talked about how she approached them and how she sold it to them. And it was really ingenious of, we are your solution and, and they bought it and they're, they're paying a very good rate. That would be great if you could share her contact information and even her presentation that would um, and we can definitely share that with people on the, on the call here. I'm going to send all of this to Danny right yeah. afterward, and then he can pass it along yep. to you all. That's the best way to do it. Cause, um, okay. So are there other questions for Danielle or other things that you would like to know about this whole CCAM process and how this federal funds can be shared? because now's the time to ask it. And I know it can get a bit overwhelming um, taking a look at some of this data, but um, it's great that there are 130 programs that can fund transportation. It's just a matter of allowing or figuring out how to get them to do that. Um, and I will just mention, we're in the process at FTA of updating our um, standard guidance for grant making, which is our internal resource that all of our um, regional offices use and our, um, as well as updating our circulars, so external guidance to grantees. And we will be including um, these resources <clears throat> as well as in our, um, our contractors that do triennial reviews, including our coordination guidance, our CCAM program inventory, guidance about federal fund matching, just to make sure um, that it's clear that it's eligible. And um, so you'll be seeing that those updates when they come out. Okay, that's awesome. I think that we've all, we've always kind of struggled with people trying to get them to understand that the way transportation is funded, there is always a match, no matter if that's buying buses or operating, and that's both in rural and urban areas. And um, you know, the, the the match funds are always different. And for those of us in rural, um, for grant programs, it's usually an 80-20, but, you know, for operating costs, it's a 50-50, and mm -hmm. um, rural agencies are rural. We have fewer resources, and we're being asked to match more of the funds that we get in order to, you know, um, propel ourselves forward with technology and services and programs, and yet there's this barrier of this large amount of match money we have to come up with, and a lot of times people don't understand that. They just think, well, you're a, you're a government program, therefore the government just gives you all that money. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, no, we're, we're not funded that way. <laughs> so we've been talking about that for a really long time for, for rural areas, but um, I don't know, off topic. I just fear that all of this money that's being given to transportation to help propel us forward with electric vehicles and operating and all of that, if, that match money is going to be a real struggle for rural areas to be able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, FTA or this administration comes to some kind of realization that these rules and good stuff that they're doing, but still with the old 
same policies and regulations that they put on us, they don't mesh well together. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm afraid that we're going to be leaving money on the table that, and then it's going to look like we didn't need it. And that's just not going to be the problem. It's the problem is we can't use it because we can't find match money. Mm -hmm. So hopefully if we can get some of this, tap into some of this money that could help with that situation. So that's where I I think we are talking about it at a good time. So, and I know you'll do the the best you can with um, the ideas that you came up with, with talking points and that kind of stuff, because you've done an amazing job on the CCAM stuff. Thank you. And I'll make sure to pull Jeremy in and, and use him as a resource through NADTC. Right, Jeremy? Yeah, thank you for the shout out. Um, we at NADTC, we do quite a bit of work and research um, looking at uh, local level issues and um, systems that are doing great work. Um, so I've put a link to our mailing list uh, to join um, our uh, newsletters and different announcements of different funding sources that um, are out quite regularly. Um, it just went out this morning, actually, so you missed um, this month's um, mailing. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you for the shout out for the TA centers. Um, all of them have quite a bit of resources um, that can help with everything that was talked about today, um, just depending on what your particular focus might be. Um, NADTC is focused on aging and disability. So, um, you know, that's our focus, but if your focus may be something on um, shared rides or um, different um, mobility device type technologies, um, you can look at other systems like that. But um, I just wanted to say thank you, Danielle, for (laughs) dropping my name a few times. and, And I wanted to just say hello and thank you and Uh, there's my resource in the chat. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Any other questions, comments, discussions for Dan while that, while, while we have Danielle here? All right. Well, I'll, um, stop sharing and then I'll drop a few things in the chat and then, uh, you guys are welcome to follow up with me if you have any follow up questions or, um, comments through email. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much.